Hello again. Uh, my name is Quentin Matthews with QKM, and today I am going to continue uh, my investigation into the issues around white collar crime, their effect on our capital markets, and potential solutions to the problem. Today, uh, we have a treat. We are looking at the uh, problem in a uh, whole different light and a very intriguing solution. Uh, from an unexpected source, Mr. Andy Fastow. Uh, for most of you, you, you uh, Mr. Fastow needs no introduction, but uh, for those of you who are unaware with who he is, he was the CFO of Enron Corp, which is arguably the largest and, and most famous financial fraud in recent history. Uh, Enron ushered in a new paradigm of aggressive accounting shenanigans including artificially inflating revenues and hiding debts uh, in off-balance sheet vehicles that they called special purpose vehicles. Um, as the CFO, Andy <clears throat> really was the architect of the financials and those dealings. In 2004, he uh, pleaded guilty to two counts of uh, conspiracy to commit uh, securities fraud and wire fraud, I believe. Uh, for which he pled guilty and was sentenced to six years in prison, getting out in 2011. Uh, today, Andy speaks and consults uh, on matters regarding um, accounting and accounting frauds and is invested in a company called the Keen Corp, which has a uh, very intriguing um, technology on how you can sniff out white collar crime uh, before it happens. So with that, uh, very pleased to uh, present Mr. Andy Fastow, Andy, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Quentin. So, uh, you know, you obviously have very personal uh, opinions and views on the issues surrounding white collar crime and, and in particular, uh, accounting fraud. And, and interestingly, they're actually very aligned with the, uh, the short sellers who uncovered a lot of the shenanigans that were uh, occurring at Enron and, and what is now often referred to as Enron's legal fraud. So I was, I was hoping we could start by looking at what you believe the problem is as you see it and kind of this concept of what legal fraud is. Okay, um, but before I do that, Quentin, um, I'd like to make one thing clear, um, really, and it's important that people remember what I'm gonna say now as I talk about this concept of legal fraud, uh, it's very important. And, and that is that um, I believe that what I did was wrong. I believe that what I did was unethical. I believe that what I did was illegal. I take full responsibility for my actions. And, and probably if um, there's one person who's most responsible for Enron's failure, uh, it's me. Um, so um, nothing I say today should be interpreted in any way as uh, me making an excuse for what I did or minimizing what I did or blaming other people for what I did. I own it. Um, and there may be people, in fact, who are even watching uh, this video who were harmed uh, by what happened at Enron, by, by my actions. And uh, if there are, uh, I apologize to you. Um, I don't expect anyone to accept my apology, but uh, you deserve to hear it. Um, so, okay, with that, um, uh, let me get to your question. Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have an important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on Real Vision's YouTube channel, that is just the tip of an iceberg. You should come over to realvision.com and see how we are not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts and fellow subscribers and learn from everyone's experience. It is an experience which you live and you learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Nice to you. Um, I don't expect anyone to accept my apology, but uh, you deserve to hear it. Um, so, okay, with that, um, 
uh, let me get to your question, this concept of legal fraud. Um, it's, it's interesting. The first time I heard that phrase was uh, from Jim Chanos and Bethany McLean. And Jim is, I'm sure you're aware, is <clears throat> one of the preeminent short sellers uh, in the country. And Bethany McLean is co-author of the book Smartest Guys in the Room, which is um, uh, the best or most well-respected book about Enron. And I was on a panel with them giving a talk. And, and uh, that's how they referred to Enron as legal fraud. Um, I, I sort of had heard the concept uh, long before. I'm a bit older uh, than you and, and Bethany. And uh, Michael Kinsley, who's uh, an old uh, columnist and commentator, you know, famously once said, the scandal isn't what's illegal, the scandal is what's legal. And this is the, this is the issue, is most people think of fraud as being very black and white. Um, you're breaking the rules or you're not breaking the rules. Good guys, bad guys, evil versus good. Um, that's not the Enron story. And in my opinion, that's not the story at most companies that uh, suffer from this problem, which may later be called fraud. But whether the problem is criminal prosecution or uh, a plaintiff's attorney attack or a short seller attack or a social media disaster, or just a huge decrease in shareholder wealth, um, I think most of it is caused in the gray area. What do I mean by that? Uh, the rules are not black and white. And when I say the rules, I mean accounting rules, tax rules, securities laws. They are complex. They're ambiguous. Uh, sometimes they're nonsensical. Sometimes the rules don't even exist for what you're doing. A lot of CFOs, a lot of business people look at a situation where the rules may be unclear and they say, that's a problem. I can't make a decision. That's not how I looked at it. The way I looked at it was if the rules are complex, ambiguous, nonsensical, or if the rules don't even exist yet for what I'm doing, that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity to solve my problem or to hit my target. What I did at Enron was I never tried to break the rules but I always did try to exploit the rules to my advantage, to hit my targets. Um, there's a word for this, you know, that we have in the English language, it's a loophole. You know, I give lots of talks every year. I, uh, last year I gave over 60 talks around the world. They have the word loophole in every language. And I always start off by asking people, uh, how many people think the word loophole is a pejorative, a bad word? And almost no one raises their hand. Why would they? The definition of loophole is means that you're technically following the rule, but that you're intentionally getting around the purpose of that rule. In my mind, that's what I'm most guilty of when I was CFO of Enron. That's what I was trying to do all the time. So I was trying to be misleading, make no mistake about it. And that's wrong. And ultimately, that, that I agree, that's illegal. It's so certainly unethical. Um, but at the time, the way my brain was working was that this is just creative. I'm solving the problem. It's interesting because that thought process where your brain is solving a problem and you're justifying it by saying, I'm doing it and it's okay because I'm following the rules is the common thread you find in all of these corporate disasters from Enron to the financial crisis to General Electric and Boeing today. They weren't necessarily people who were trying to break the rules, but were they trying to get around the principle of those rules? Probably. And eventually that caught up with them. Um, I wanna show you one thing just to sort of drive this home. Um, this is the trophy that was given to me by CFO Magazine. CFO Magazine named me CFO of the year in the year 2000. Um, and it's really interesting. If you go back, if you were to go back and read that article, it's kind of falling apart. You used to have a star up here that fell off. Now it's just giving me the finger. Um, if you were to go back and read that article in CFO magazine, what you would find is they gave it to me for two reasons. The first reason was for doing off balance sheet financing. And for, I think your audience knows what that is, but in case someone doesn't, it means financial transactions that companies sometimes do 
that convert what would otherwise show up as debt on the balance sheet into some other legal form so they appear in the footnotes instead. Um, and if you're really good at it, it's called off credit and it doesn't even show up in the footnotes. Um, and there's good reasons for companies to do that. It lowers a weighted average cost of capital, it helps their credit rating, um, makes them more profitable. The second reason they gave me the trophy was for doing something called structured finance transactions. These are financial transactions that companies sometimes do that may or may not have an underlying business purpose, but the effect of which is to change the appearance of the financial statements. So, you know, as a hedge fund guy yourself, you know that companies can enter into financial transactions with their banks, with other financial counterparties that may have no business purpose whatsoever, but change the appearance of the financial statements. And back in the year 2000, we were really good at that. That's why I got the trophy. The other thing I want to show you is this. This is my prison identification card. Every inmate in a federal prison has to carry this with them at all times. I got both of these for doing the same deals. How is that possible? How is it possible to be CFO of the year and go to federal prison doing the same deals? How is it possible to be CFO of the year, commit the greatest fraud in corporate American history doing the same deals? And I'll make it even more difficult for you. How? And I'll tell you that every single deal I did when I was at Enron, was approved by Enron's accountants, by the outside auditors, um, by Enron's attorneys, by Enron's outside attorneys, and by the board of directors, and no information was withheld. How is that possible? How is it possible to have all of those gatekeepers, all of those really smart people approve all of your deals, and yet you're committing fraud? And the short answer is loopholes. This is, uh, you know, it's there's, there's so much to unpack here. And what, what I love about um, what we're going to get into here at the beginning is, is what I think can really be an education for investors who, um, who don't necessarily know how the sausage is made. And, and I think even more professional investors as myself, um, you know, don't completely understand because they're not inside the companies. Um, and what we're really talking about in essence here is the ability to follow the rules as they've been laid out by accountants and lawyers and at the same time mislead and defraud. And I think that as you alluded to, um, you can, um, uh, just because an accountant signs off on it doesn't mean the intent wasn't there, right? So, you know, let's, I'd like to go through each of these groups and kind of look, and let's start with the accountants and, and just a very simple answer or simple question uh, that I think most people would have the wrong answer to, which is, do auditors exist to uncover fraudulent activity at corporations? Well, you know, at the risk of, you know, sounding like Bill Clinton depends how you define the word fraud. Yeah. Um, but I'd say, yes, they exist to uncover uh, fraud in the sense of people breaking rules. Do they exist to uncover wrongdoing? Not necessarily. You know, it's important, it's important. I, in my opinion, Arthur Anderson and the people who worked for Anderson did nothing wrong with, relate, with regard to Enron. I mean, I'm not talking about the document shredding, that's wrong, obviously. But with regard to their accounting, they did exactly what auditors are supposed to do. They, and this is really an important distinction. An auditor is only there to tell you if you're following the rules. They are not there to tell you whether or not your financial statements would be fair and not misleading to an ordinary person. Those are two fundamentally different concepts, but we tend to lump them all together. We tend to conflate those two concepts, and it's important that people understand they're, they're very different concepts. This is, I don't, I don't want to go completely down this rabbit hole, but because you brought it up. So if Arthur Anderson wasn't doing anything incorrectly, why did they shred an inordinate amount of documents when the heat came on? Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't answer that definitively. I could only tell you what I heard um, at the time, which is that 
Arthur Anderson was afraid that the SEC would consider some of their accounting decisions incorrect and that they would be sanctioned. And they hadn't cleansed their files of, uh, of all their notes, which might have been, you know, because when auditors uh, evaluate a complex transaction, they write all the pros and the cons. And then what they're supposed to do is write their final memo and destroy all the pros and cons notes. Um, but they hadn't done that. Um, so I, but um, look, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I wish they had kept all their notes. It would have uh, shown that they considered everything that had to be considered. Okay, so I'd like to look at what the auditing process looks like. And, you know, I've gotten a somewhat unique view of this being involved as, as uh, the audience here uh, knows or those who have watched before uh, in my litigation with, with farmland partners and you know, when you go through discovery, you you get some inside look at um, how some of the interactions between management and accounting and the auditing happens. Um, but what does the process look like kind of from a more detailed than broad, but we don't have to get in everything. But I mean, you know, how do they choose what documents to look at? Um, how are those documents picked? And you know, I, I guess was it, if you're playing, and again, I know this is somewhat hard because you, you felt that you weren't necessarily doing anything wrong at the time, but is it, a, is it a game of trying to hide certain things from the auditors if that's kind of your intent or just convincing them that this gray area should be seen a certain way? Well, um I would describe the process. I think I think the way you ask the question is you describe the process of uh, as an antagonistic process, um, and I would describe the process as more of a collaborative process. You know, Arthur Anderson was responsible not only for our external audit function but our internal audit function as well at Enron. So their auditors were on premise all the time, and they had access to everything, um, as far as I know. Now, I wasn't the chief accounting officer, and I didn't work directly with Arthur Anderson very often. Um, so I'm not the right person to ask about which documents. But my understanding is they had access to all documents. And um, it was not a case of trying to keep them in the dark. You know, the way we viewed our auditor was they're part of the team. Um, they're there to, to help us get the deal done and get it de done right. Um, you know, Arthur Anderson... Um, did not approve a lot of deals at Enron. That was a normal case, um, which I think has sort of got lost in translation. Um, they would regularly say if some if a proposed transaction violated an accounting rule in their opinion. But when that happened, they didn't act like a judge and just say yes or no. We all got in a room together. And we figured out ways to restructure the transaction so that it would fit within the rules and we'd all accomplish our goals. So they were, they knew what our objectives were. They were helping us get there, not by breaking the rules, but by um, using the rules. You want me to, I could give you an example of one of those. Yeah, please, please. Okay, so uh, this is before I was CFO, back in the early nine, mid nineties, Enron acquired a smaller pipeline company. Um, it was about a billion dollar acquisition and I was responsible for the financing. And uh, we were gonna use a very simple off balance sheet structure an operating lease. And I know the operating lease rules have changed, but back then it was the most ubiquitous form of structured financing in the world. I mean, I think there's, there's uh, over a trillion dollars of assets in the United States finance and operating leases. And that's a great off balance sheet financing tool, it lowers your cost of capital, gets you access to additional pools of capital. Um, and so we we're going to use that. And it's, it was a really simple deal, an operating lease. I mean, nothing really to negotiate. Uh, the documents were boilerplate. And we're going through the process, and we're two days before closing. And one of the attorneys who was doing due diligence discovered that Enron actually indirectly already owned a tiny piece of the pipeline we were acquiring. Enron had invested in another company that had invested in a partnership that bought a little spur of the pipe. Well, it turns out under the lease operating rules, accounting rules, you cannot do an operating lease 
on any asset if you own even a tiny piece of it. I mean, if we had owned one screw in that pipeline, we could not do an operating lease. So Arthur Anderson said it violates the rules. You can't do it. Well, the economic impact of doing this off balance sheet versus on balance sheet was $50 million per year, okay? So a 10-year deal, $500 million. This was a lot of economic value. And they said we couldn't do it. So it looked like we were gonna have to finance it on balance sheet, which was a disaster. But instead of just saying, we're gonna break the rules, which we wouldn't say, wouldn't have said, and instead of putting it on balance sheet, we all got in a room. Enron's accountants, the Arthur Anderson accountants, Enron's attorneys, the outside attorneys, the bankers, we were all in a room together and everyone's throwing around ideas and we couldn't figure out how to structure around this. And then someone at the last minute says, hey, Andy, I have an idea. We can't do an operating lease on the physical pipeline because we already own a tiny piece of it, albeit indirectly. How about instead of leasing the physical pipeline, we lease the name of the holding company that owns the pipeline. And then in the lease agreement, just add a provision that allows us to use any of their assets. If the bankers are willing to be one more step removed from the physical asset, maybe it'll work. And we all looked around the room and we're like, can you do that? And we turned to the Anderson partner. He said, I don't know, I have to call headquarters. We turned to the lawyer. He said, I don't have to do, well, I have to do some research. We turned to the banker. He said, I don't know, I'll call credit committee. We got back into the room the next day, turned to the Anderson partner. He said, I talked to the guys in the ivory tower. That's what they used to call headquarters in Chicago. He said, they said they can find no rule that prohibits you from doing this. We turned to the lawyer. He said, I can find no law that prohibits you from doing this. We turned to the banker. He said, are you kidding? This is a whole new product line for us. We're in. So we did what I believe was the first operating lease of an intangible asset. So let me ask you, Quentin, because I typically will ask my audiences if I use that case. Was that evil or was that genius? Uh I need a little, I, I'm going to give you an answer, but then I'm going to want some more information because this has all led me somewhere. Uh, I'm going to say, and I'm a skeptic, evil. And the reason is, is because a couple minutes ago, you said that Arthur Anderson, you guys were all working towards the same objective. Let me ask two things. One, what did they believe the objective was? So we can take this particular deal, which you have... For some reason, having this $50 million, I don't know if you've got to put the $500 million on or the $50 million and whether it was a balance sheet or an income deal, but it was a disaster. And so there was a reason that you guys did not want it on, which would lead me to believe, if I knew that piece of information, that, that it makes your financials look worse, which then floods down to the objective of we don't get paid as much or our stock goes down or whatever it is. So, but... Also, why are their objectives aligned? So what was what did they think the objective was? And then why it was to finance should... it was to finance it off balance sheet. And that saves $50 million a year direct to earnings. Was it cash or just income stream? Cash. But the auditors have to know, right? That that well, let me I guess put it this way, because usually what happens in these accounting scenarios is that the accounting vision of it is completely different versus one way, but the economic reality is usually the same. So you were saying in this situation that the economic reality was actually different. One was a cash outflow under one and one was not a cash outflow uh, under under the other. If you do it, if you do it, if you did it on the balance sheet, it was it would I should say to impact your EPS by $50 million a year for 10 years negatively. But not not the cash flow. Cash would you're right. Cash would be the same. Cash would be the same. So there's the nefarious intent. And where I see the problem, okay, but this is what we're addressing here, right? This idea of legal fraud. Uh, where I see the problem in that is that the accountant was also the internal accountant, and you guys were all after the same objective, which in this case was to get something 
off balance sheet because it made your income statement look better, but the economic reality wasn't different either way. Here's I, I hear what you're saying, but here's the problem, Quentin. You just defined an operating lease. An operating lease is no different than debt it, in term, in substance, just in form. So this was just allowing us to do an operating lease we otherwise would have been doing had we yeah. not owned that tiny piece of the pipeline. So if you're telling me you think all of the companies that have done a trillion dollars of operating lease financing are committing fraud, I would disagree with you. Well, I guess if you had, if there was a disclosure, which I don't know if there was, I mean, I think if you do it this way and say, hey, look, we own a little piece of this. So here's the structure that we did. But my my guess is that the the disclosures of exactly why that decision was come to were not. It was an operating lease like any other operating lease. So that's how it was disclosed. So this gives you this gives you an insight. But I will tell you at the time, we weren't thinking it's evil or, you know, keep it secret. We were celebrating and high fiving and calling Institutional Investor magazine to pitch it as deal of the year. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that banker was out within a week marketing it to every other energy company that structured every other energy company in Houston. Um, this is the thought process. So but the, I think today the real answer to that question, was it evil or genius is it's a bit of both. And it kind of, a, you know, encapsulates this gray area issue that leads to the problem. So if that type of decision to do a deal like that, exploit the rules in that way, find that loophole was acceptable. Why wouldn't the next more aggressive deal be acceptable so long as, again, we're within the rules? And using the justification that I'm not breaking a rule, uh, that's the number one justification uh, for decisions that ultimately lead to these corporate disasters, whether you ultimately call it fraud or not. Um, it's usually this way of thinking. Yeah. And it's it's ultimately it's stemming from a desire that comes from um, some sort of incentive system that's been set up. We're being incentivized to show higher profits, whether they're whether that's accurate, whether it's inaccurate, whether it's a, a, a complete view. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, fan, you know, just fascinating that, that and, and we got at this when we talked to Isinger about how, you know, we don't post Arthur Anderson, you know, we really don't go after the, um, uh, the gatekeepers anymore. And this highlights to me, you know, a problem where there should be, I, I'm not saying that the gatekeepers, the accounts and the lawyers shouldn't be there to assist. Um, they should be there to assist, but there also should be somebody in that picture going, what's the real motive and what's the objective and why are our objectives aligned with them if we're supposed to be? I, you know, you know, the answer to who that is in a practical sense, the short sellers. Yeah. Well, and we'll, and we'll get to how, you know, we'll get to maybe how we can use, you know, usurp the, the short sellers with our, our solution here in a bit, but all right. So let's go past the auditors and, Let's go to the board. And in our previous discussion before we got on, uh, I think you mentioned that there was a, a board member, I don't know who it was or if you disclosed, but who lost a fantastic amount and therefore uh, would be, of Enron, it, it would be nearly impossible to say that this individual um, would have been incentivized to play games that thought would blow up this this huge investment that he had in the, he or she had in the company. So, um, but I think that, the misperception with the board is that the board is familiar with all the information that the management team is. And in reality, what it is, is the board gets together in a somewhat cushy environment to be presented a presentation of facts that has been just well curated by a management team to present what they want to present. So again, you've got another situation where maybe the board uh, is not there to protect investors in the sense that um, investors generally think of them as being fiduciary. So uh, I, I guess in general, do you agree with that? And then if you could kind of the same way that we went through with the auditors, what what the interactions with the board uh, was like or is like in a corporation, but was like with some of the, the transactions um, that were more notable at Enron? 
Yeah, um, I'm not sure that I agree with all of the premise in that, that kind of long question, but um, if I can back up before talking about yeah. the board, let me, let me, I think when most people come at this discussion of fraud, they're thinking good guy, bad guy, uh, evil intent, um, good intent. In my view, 99.99% of people, whether they're CFOs, CEOs, or anyone working in a company, they don't want to commit fraud. They don't want to do the wrong thing. They don't want to be unethical. The, and, and we tend to t have this whole discussion about ethics and, and behavior in corporations as a, a, an ethical decision that people are choosing to do the wrong thing or choosing to be bad or choosing to be lazy. Or I don't think that's the case. I think most people, the vast, vast majority of people really want to do the right thing. The problem isn't convincing people to do the right thing. The problem is convincing people to see that they have a decision to make. When I was CFO of Enron, when I did that pipeline transaction, for example, I never stopped to think, well, is this misleading? Is that, am I violating my fiduciary responsibility? As soon as I heard the, you're, you're compliant with the rules, I stopped asking questions. I knew the answer, our brains know the answers we want and our brains are really good at finding ways to get to those answers. And uh, we're very creative. You know, our human brain's very creative, which is a good thing most of the time. Um, you know, you never bought a book probably that said think inside the box, right? Um, you know, we're supposed to think outside the box, push to the edge of the envelope, create a new paradigm. You know, on January 2nd, you sit down with the senior management team and you know what the answer is at the end of every quarter. The CEO doesn't say, hey, just do as good as you can wherever we get by year end, that's okay. You know the answer. And then it's your job to find the way there, not by breaking the rules. No one's going to ask you to break the rules. And I don't think anyone, you know, very many people in the world want you to break the rules. But they do expect you to be creative and find a way to get there. And it's in that creative area, this gray area, especially when we're using the rules to our advantage, that this risk occurs. And our brains are very bad at identifying, pricing, and managing that risk in the gray area. Because our brains are trained to think, as long as I'm following the rules and I've got permission, that's all I need. I'm okay. And that's not okay. It wasn't okay at Enron. It wasn't okay with the banks. It, it wasn't okay at General Electric. You see that lost, what, $700 billion of market cap. It wasn't okay at Boeing and, you know, and hundreds of companies in between. But they were more often than not cases where people were technically following rules, but one day the market woke up and they said, yeah, but these numbers don't make sense. And once that happens, you're doomed. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, to me, it gets to the, as someone who enjoys accounting, and my real goal is to understand the arbitrage, what I look for, whether it's a long or a short, generally more on the short, but you're looking for an arbitrage between what the accounting says and what the <laughs> true economic reality is. And somewhere, there's always going to be a difference because that ultimately is what gap accounting is. But somewhere in there is an area where you, it goes beyond where the intent of what you're trying to show is, is to cover yeah. up your economic reality. That's right. And that's a gray area. And there's yeah. no, and that's where companies get in trouble because there's no clear line. Um, you know, this all really began in, in, in my thinking back in the mid 80s. And what happened in the mid 80s really was there were a few new accounting innovations, things like mark to market accounting and fair value accounting. Um, and and um, that caused a very interesting thing to happen. Uh, before then, when you said earnings, it usually meant cash. After that, earnings and cash began to diverge, okay? And so companies figured out very quickly that they could use mark-to-market -market and fair value accounting and some of the other accounting rules to create 
earnings today, even though the cash may or may not come in tomorrow. In order to do that, you have to make a lot of assumptions and that's dangerous gray area, okay? And then the second thing that happened is this introduction of structured finance. Um, mm. And um, it became easier and easier to enter into transactions or make assumptions or use accounting rules to create this divergence between earnings and cash. And that's just like the most fertile ground for short sellers like you. Um, and, um, you know, companies, companies uh, it's a very dangerous drug. It's like crack. Yeah. So back to the board. Yeah. What is the board? Just so investors, again, I mean, I really want investors to be able to take away um, kind of from the horse's mouth so they can better understand when a management team is out there talking to them, whether the management team believes what they're saying or not, they can maybe have somewhat of a better educated view of this is the role that the different people at the company are playing and maybe why I should look at somewhat of an askance eye. So what's yeah. what's the board's role in, in understanding these transactions, how they get presented to the board and and, and playing the duty? Yeah, well, look, um, uh, first I'd say that the Enron directors uh, were uh, a very impressive group. Um, they were brilliant people, very successful people. It was not a showcase type of board where, you know, you put a lot of politicians on and things like that. These are people who really understood accounting and business. You know, the chairman of our audit committee was the former dean of Stanford Business School and chair emeritus of the accounting department uh, at Stanford. Um, the chairman of the finance committee, you know, ran one of the largest finance companies in America. I mean, these are these are guys, chair of the executive committee, you know, founded and grew uh, a huge energy company. So these are these are really accomplished, smart people. Um, one, I think they understood exactly what we were doing uh, conceptually. Could they do the transactions themselves? You know, could they go down to the trading floor and do trades themselves? No, but you know, you don't expect a director to do that. Uh, but I think they understood, I know they understood we were being misleading. Um, what they, oh, their standard was the same as my standard, which is, are we following the rules? And so long as the auditors said, yes, you have a clean opinion, and the attorneys said, yes, I'm going to give you a clean legal opinion, um, they didn't ask additional questions. One of the reasons I say that I think I'm the person probably most responsible for Enron's failure is because I, as CFO, should have been asking the question, would a reasonable person under normal circumstances behave this way? And I never asked that question. And the board didn't ask it, not, not because of malevolence or laziness, but that's just not the way their brain was working. They knew the answer they wanted to. Um, let me give you let me give you a story about how, uh, which I think uh, is a good example of how when we get into this gray area, we're, while we think we're really good at identifying and pricing and managing risk, we're really not. But uh, I did a deal at Enron called LJM. This was uh, the most infamous of all of my deals. Um, I don't think, by the way, that it was the worst of all of my deals. Just the most infamous. Um, but it was a deal that was um, that ultimately uh, the Wall Street Journal started writing about in October of 2001, and that triggered the spiral of events that led to bankruptcy in December. But that deal was actually approved back in June of 1999, so about 21 months or 27 months before that. And um, it was a very unusual deal because it was one in which I was going to have a conflict of interest with the com company. Enron had asked me, this is the CEO and the chairman of Enron asked me to go outside of Enron, set up my own private equity fund that would then enter into deals with Enron, structured finance deals, so we could get these structured finance deals done quickly, more quickly. And there was one in particular that we had to get done by the end of June, 1999. Uh, and it was a big deal. It was going to result in $400 million of earnings for Enron. Because that was like half of 1999's earnings. Um, so um, now 
related party transactions are not illegal. Conflicts of interest are not illegal, but they have to go to the board for approval. And so they convened a special board meeting to debate this situation. And first they had Arthur Anderson come in and Arthur Anderson explained why it met the accounting standards of a unrelated or unaffiliated third party so the accounting would work and all the controls they had built in to manage conflict of interest, et cetera. And then the attorneys came in and they explained why it's legal and what the disclosures would look like. And so everyone says everything's legal. But then the discussion got interesting. And it basically boiled down to a discussion between this is on the one hand, it's completely legal, but on the other hand, it looks really bad. All right, it's classic reputation risk problem. Okay. And they kept going back and forth. And then I remember this so vividly because in the, in the middle of the conversation, the chairman of the executive committee of the board uh, turns to Skilling and he says, Jeff, what's our biggest risk here? And Skilling responded, Wall Street Journal risk. There's no question that this deal is completely legal, but make no mistake about it, this deal stinks. That's what the CEO of the company said to the chairman of the executive committee of the board. This deal stinks. And he said, look, if a reporter gets hold of this or an equity analyst gets hold of it, it's going to stink for a while. So you would think today, right, looking back, everyone would have just said time out, you know, kill the deal. They didn't. What they said is, you know, if a reporter gets hold of it, we'll bring him down here to Houston. We'll sit him down with Arthur Anderson. We'll sit him down with our outside attorneys. They'll see it's completely legal. Problem goes away. It's the hubris when it comes to identifying pricing and managing risk that gets us into trouble. There's no way the Wall Street Journal reporter, John Menschweiler, is going to come down to Houston, sit down with Arthur Anderson and, and the outside attorneys, and then write an article that basically says, never mind. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Well, because it gets down to the, uh, it gets down to what you said, that the board knew that they were being misleading, but you were fulfilling the objective of we're following the rules. And perhaps, I, I don't know how you do this, this is a conversation for another day, but perhaps the objective should be not only to follow the rules, but to follow them while not being misleading, you know, which is a, uh, which is yeah, the gray to, area, you know, who but. gets, who gets to decide that? Exactly. Exactly. It's tough. Well, um, as we'll, as we'll allude to your, you know, perceptions change in, in, in people when you do things that make you feel a certain way. And, and we'll get to that. Um, let me, let me give you another case study, Quentin. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry it. to put you on the spot here. No, I love okay, it. so back in 2015, I was hired to do a little consulting work by a hedge fund, and I was evaluating an uh, independent mid-size oil and gas company. So you know, think of it as a horizontal driller, fracker type company. And um, I'm looking at the 2014 financials, and I noticed that in calculating their economically recoverable reserves. And by the way, for those of your viewers who don't know what that is, that's actually an accounting term, which means the company's best estimate of the value of the oil and gas that's still in the ground that they believe they could produce at a profit. But in order to come up with that estimate, you have to make a lot of assumptions, how much oil and gas is in the ground, the cost of drilling, the cost of producing, cost of transport, most importantly, what the price of the commodity is. And this company was showing that their um, economically recoverable reserves had gone way up. That made a lot of sense because they were using the newest technology. It should be going up. But here is the problem. The price of oil had dropped from $110 per barrel down to $50 per barrel. With the drop in the price of the commodity, that should have caused some of the reserves to be uneconomic, made mm -hmm. the price go down. So I'm thinking technology is pushing it up, prices are pushing it down. Couldn't figure out which way it should go, but I knew intuitively shouldn't have been going way up. So I did some digging. And this is what I found. For purposes of financial reporting, the company assumed the price of oil was $95 per barrel. The problem was that on December 31st, and when they released their financials, the price of oil was around $50 per barrel. How big of a difference does that one assumption make? If they had used 50 instead of 95, 
they would have had to lower their economically recoverable reserves by 61%. Flip that on its head. That's like saying on a market value basis, they overstated reserves by more than 100%. Yeah. That happens to be the key metric that Wall Street looks at when they evaluate independent medium sized oil and gas companies. So just based on that, those facts, do you think what, what they did was misleading and unethical? Did, where did you find the uh, $95? Was that in their financials or did you have to dig somewhere else to get it? I had to dig somewhere else to get them. Uh, if it's not in the financials, and even then, knowing that 95% of people probably don't even read the financials, but I could give it not misleading if it were in the financials and it's somewhat, there is an onus for investors to do their own due diligence um, and to be able to pick up a document and read. But if it's not in the document that they present to investors and you got to hire an ex-CFO uh, to find it, uh, then I would say that that's misleading. Okay, so ever, whenever I teach that case at business schools, everyone says that's unethical and misleading, right? But here's the problem. I didn't give you all the facts. I'm going to give you one more fact now. There's an SEC rule that's codified in GAAP that tells companies exactly what price to use when they calculate their economically recoverable reserves. They say you take the price of oil on the first day of each of the 12 preceding months and you average it. It turns out that in 2014, the price of oil was around $110 most of the year. Then it dropped down to 50. The average was 95. Every company used 95. They followed the rule. Um, why wouldn't you follow the rule? I mean, it's codified in GAAP. Now, you could depart from GAAP. You could, you know, to be more conservative, to make a fair statement. But that puts you at a huge disadvantage versus your peer groups. And if you depart from GAAP, you, you probably have to file a notice with the SEC saying you departed from GAAP, which is like sending a party invitation to the government. So no one did, as far as I can tell. And as far as I can tell, no one disclosed it. Yeah, I, I would still say, regardless of what the rule is or how it is, if this for me, this is my, this is how I feel. If the price of oil is fifty, and your provable reserves, which change each quarter based on all these calculations, um, is based on ninety-five, then you should go out there and say, look, this is what we think we have. And we even you could say, we think oil is going to be 95. So we think we're going to get this. But if you were to do it at 50, which it is today, um, the number there's be, no there's no requirement to do that. Exactly. Well, which is part of the problem, in my opinion. Well, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're saying the problem is now. OK, right. So you have a rule. That's an SEC rule. It's a gap rule. I thought I just heard you say before that you you should be able to assume that people know what the rules are. If they're investing in the oil and gas industry, shouldn't you be able to assume that they know that rule? No, no, no. They should be. You should assume that there's some onus to look through the financials. Um, but you, I, I don't think that there's an onus on the investor to understand how they calculate the oil price. But even that the fact that the oil price wasn't in there, if it said 95 for whatever the reason was, then somebody could go, wait a second, this is 95, price is 50, there's probably a difference. They could go do some investigation or calculation or call the company. But if the, if the number's not in there at all, to me, that's misleading. Well, look, I mean, this is, this is problematic then. So we're gonna, have a, uh, we're gonna agree to disagree here. Accounting rules don't always make sense. Do you assume that people who are reading financial statements know accounting rules? No, I don't. Well, so why why aren't you saying you have to repost every accounting rule in the footnotes? Yeah, it's you can't. You can't. You have to have some ability to say, uh, or everything grinds to a halt. You have to have some ability to say, people, if they're reading a financial statement, you assume some level of literacy. But it's fair to say that the client that you were hired to do this probably didn't go long the stock after you found that. Well, I, I won't talk about it <laughs> one way or the other. But, um, but the point is, everyone followed the rule, but every financial statement in the oil and gas industry was misleading. Yeah. That's but the gray area. That's the problem. And that's where the problems occur. Now, in that case, 
um, no one was prosecuted as far as I know. Um, everyone was doing it. And that's what happens most of the time. But um, there are more than enough examples of companies that do get attacked either criminally or civilly or just social media mobs or short sellers, um, uh, you know, where they may have just been following a rule and assumed, you know, people should be able to figure it out. I mean, that's how my brain works. Look, I was the way I thought of it was, and I think the way a lot of CFOs think about it, but they won't say it this way is everyone gets the rule books. Yeah. Get the accounting rules, the tax rules, whichever CFO can best exploit the rules helps his team win. That's how it works. Yeah. And, and I think somewhat, um, my view on this is not whether to be misleading or not. Um, because I, I see, I see your point and it's a gray area. Um, the way I always look at it is, is, and I think that you've you've alluded to this a couple times, is that what we're really doing is we're looking for risks, and um, it's the ability to be able to um, find where that risk is. And and the truth of the matter is, is some people are going to be able to do it because they're inclined to, or they're interested in accounting, and some people aren't. And you know, it, it's it's hard to make it fair, whatever fair is for everybody, right? But um, I, there's two more, before we get to the solution, there's two more groups that I'd like to quickly touch on. And um, the next one is the, the lawyers. And one of the topics that, you know, that I've discussed on this series is the idea that um, we have outsourced as a country um, regulation to the law firms. So short seller comes out or Wall Street Journal or whatever, comes out with some news, company hires the independent uh, and lawyers to do the investigation. And uh, nobody ever, of course, gets to see the, the internals of that. There's no FOIA for it. Um, and we've really kind of outsourced the regulation. And so I, I don't know if that was prevalent uh, at Enron, but if you have any thoughts on kind of the role that the lawyers play in. Well, I'm not sure that I agree with um, the premise of the question that we've outsourced regulation. Um, but that aside, I'll just talk about um, uh, the lawyers at Enron. Um, lawyers are not ethical gatekeepers. They are not there to protect the shareholders. Lawyers are there to opine on whether a deal is legal, meaning it's following the law. And if it's not, to help you structure it so it is within the law, mm -hmm. period. The assumption that people have that auditors and that attorney attorneys are somehow uh, uh, obligated or morally responsible for the behavior uh, of a company uh, is wrong. It's, it's a premise that leads to the wrong conclusions. That's not their job. And we have to understand that's not their job. And I don't think they want that. I wouldn't want that job. There'd be too much liability with it. Um, they are there to help you figure out how to do your deal. I mean, the typical conversation a CFO has uh, is uh, with his bankers or his auditors or his attorneys is, what is your problem this quarter? What you just said is so important. And I just want to repeat it because I think that for investors, more layman investors need to understand this. They are not there to be your the, the company or the executive's moral compass or fiduciary even for the shareholders. And I think, um, you know, where I was going with the idea that we've outsourced regulation is the idea that, um, and this is really Jesse Isinger's, you know, kind of idea that, um, so the, the revolving door that comes from attorneys leaving the Department of Justice and going to make more money uh, at uh, big white shoe law firms. And they know how it works on the inside and they know how to present the facts of, look, we've looked at this. Here's what we're dealing with. And it's really what they're there for. They're hired by the company and lawyers are there to protect their clients and that the idea that it's there to mitigate the damage as opposed to, and I'm talking about in an internal investigation type situation, but it's it's there to mitigate the damage and the perception as opposed to 
really uncovering what maybe the lawyers at the Department of Justice would if they were to get into full prosecution mode. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm not sure I'd Fair agree enough. with that or want to opine on that. Um, look, you know, I think it's difficult to prosecute um, corporate fraud because most people who are in the position to be prosecuted were not necessarily trying to break a rule. And we're a rules-based society, a rules-based system. And so um, uh, it's hard to, you know, if you have an auditor's opinion and a legal opinion, it's kind of hard to prosecute that person. Now, I mean, I think it's, it's possible, and it certainly was in my case, but it makes it very problematic. Yeah. And um, that's that's the challenge they have. Okay, so uh, the last group, uh, before we get to our solution uh, or your solution potential here, um, uh, Wall Street firms and um, whether they be investment bankers or the sell side analysts, and um, this is not a knock on the people uh, individually. And I don't know culturally um, what drives it, if it's the investment banking fees and the, you know, lack of a Chinese wall between the investment banking and the sell side, which I think is, which is without a doubt, you know, um, that wall does not exist as, as they say it does. But, you know, if you just follow the collapse of certain, whether they're frauds or just kind of uh, malfeasance that happens at companies, Usually the sell side does not give up until the bitter end and they stick with management. And I've always wondered, why is that? What, what was your relationship like with the sell side? Um, at what point did they just kind of say, I mean, did they, did they call you at some point and just say, look, I, I can't stick by you anymore? Or I mean, what, what was kind of the inside baseball relationship there? Yeah, well, I wasn't the person who dealt with the sell side analysts. Um, we had a separate investor relations uh, guy who did that. Um, but I will tell you my observation in the in the few meetings that I did have with them uh, was that the the adjective you used to describe them, or I'd used to describe them more than any more than any other would be obsequious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it was. It was never really uh, penetrating questions. Um, and it was all the more comical in my mind because their bankers, their investment bankers were doing these structured finance deals with us. They're the ones bringing us the structures. Um, so they know that these are being done. And um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of, but they, they didn't seem to be factoring it back into their analysis. And on a conference call, I've always wondered this personally, and I'm sure it's changed over the last 20 years, technology-wise, but the management team can clearly see who's on the line and decide who they want to take calls from. I guess I've been on the line sometimes where they clearly aren't going to take from uh, outside investors or critics or, you know, what have you, and they, they want to take from people who are going to give them, you know, lob balls. But I mean, what's that look like at conference call time? Is it a, is it a screen that shows you who's on? And you can kind of see who's next and tell the operator, I don't want to talk to this person or how does that work? Well, um, we didn't have a screen back then, but it was, you know, 19 years ago. Yeah. Um, I, I don't I don't know how they picked who was next, uh, to be honest. But, you know, that's a that's a good little um, uh, indicator, by the way, when you're looking at companies. And, you know, there are a lot of little soft indicators about companies that'll tell you a lot about the management at them um, and, you know, maybe raise a red flag. But, um, and one of them is who do they let ask questions? Who gets to ask questions? You know, if a company's letting a bunch of short sellers or, you know, uh, skeptics ask questions, that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good sign. But if it's all just obsequious investment bankers, you know, tell them the CFO and the CEO how smart they are. Um, that's a bad sign. I know, I know through your consulting, and I think you've done some work with short sellers or, yeah, I think you have a decent view of short sellers now, I think is what you told me. Um, but you, um, you've got some other, I think you have a laundry list of red flags, don't you? Are there any, I mean, I think there's a lot of them that, that get spread out now. I mean, do you have any, uh, 
special red flags, word for the wise that you're willing to share? You know. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I have a list of what I call my 75 red flags, I mean, and it's sort of a check flag. checklist that I go through when I'm doing an evaluation of a company. And you know, um, you know, sometimes hedge funds hire me to do this. You know, short sellers, but um, it really should be the boards of directors and the management hiring someone like me to help them think like a short seller or a plaintiff's attorney might think um, so they could make better decisions. But um, they're, they don't do that very often. I'm not sure why they don't want to, you know, maybe it's just they don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. Um, but um, yeah, I have uh, about 75 uh, red flags. Um, you know, I, I group them, I guess, into four major categories. Um, the first, um, the first is, you know, the type of business. There are certain industries that are much more prone to um, accounting. Uh, what what word did you use? Shenanigans. You Shenanigans. said earlier. Shenanigans. Shenanigans. Um, yes, um, and those tend to be um, industries that are capital intensive, have long dated contracts have trading operations or syndication operations, use mark to market and fair value accounting. Um, the second thing I do is I look at their financials and the types of transactions they enter into. There are certain giveaways that certain types of financial transactions are being done, structured finance transactions um, that aren't you know, that readily apparent to a typical analyst, if you will. Um, and, but you could pick up most of them, not all of them, but you could pick up most of them. The third thing I look at is the compensation system. Um, as you mentioned earlier, compensation is a huge driver of behavior. Um, here's an example. Um, are employees at a company being compensated based on earnings or cash flow? That's an important question. Because if it's earnings, remember all those examples of ways to manipulate earnings, um, people are smart. They're going to figure out how to get the money. Not because they're thinking I'm doing something wrong. They're saying they want me to book earnings. So I'll book earnings. I'll use mark-to-market accounting. I'll change the assumptions of my fair value, my fair value models. I'll, you know, I'll do all these things to book earnings, but the cash may not come in. By the way, that's the Enron story. That was the underlying business problem at Enron. Um, and uh, ask yourself, why is the CFO earning so much money? How much of his compensation is based on company hitting its financial objectives or stock price? Um, the lower that is, the better. The higher it is, the more at risk you are. Not because he's going to make a conscious decision to do the wrong thing in exchange for a million dollars or $10 million, but because his brain knows the answer he wants, and it will not see the risks and price the risks the right way, not out of malevolence, just because that's how our brains work. And then finally, I look at culture, culture of the company. And I have a list of some, which I won't go into, of some, you know, funny type things, you know, that sometimes are just subtle indicators about how a company is run and how uh, free, freewheeling it is, if you will. So, all right, let's let's get. I want to leave plenty of time here for the solution because uh, all the solutions that generally get thought of are not new. What can we do at the Department of Justice? What can we do at the SEC? We can set up a whistleblower program. How do you better protect short sellers and critics so you know people can <clears throat> figure it out? And you know, you alluded to earlier short sellers um, kind of being preventative you know, bounty hunter, market bounty hunter type folks. But um, you have invested uh, in a company, um, and I'll let you give the full disclosure on that, uh, uh, called Keen Corp. And it is essentially a software company, as I understand it. And um, I think a very unique, just really cool, as you showed me what it was. So I'll, I'll let you kind of take it away from there and tell us what it is, and let's get into that. Yeah, well, it's an interesting um, story how I – met these people who started the company. I did not start the company. I, have, I am an investor in this company. Um, I invested after the company was established. 
Um, so I'm not a founder of this company. Um, but it's really interesting because, uh, and, and what this company does just in a nutshell, then I'll come back to it is, it uses natural language processing. In other words, it looks at text like emails, text messages, and it's able to identify risks that may not be obvious to management or to directors or to auditors or to attorneys. And I'll come back and talk about how it does that in a little bit. But one of the most frequent questions I get when I'm giving my talks is, you know, what could we have done or what could we do now to avoid another Enron? And the reality is Enron keeps happening over and over. I mean, all you have to do is look at General Electric today. That is Enron, but 10 times larger, 20 times larger. Um, the same thing that killed Enron is nearly wiped out GE. Now they may survive, but you know you don't necessarily feel good about it if you're one of those shareholders who watch seven hundred billion dollars evaporate. Um, and um, so I get that question all the time, and and I you know I never had a good answer to that. And then one time I was giving a talk over in uh, Amsterdam in Holland, and uh, after the talk, these guys who created this company called Keen Corp came up to me, and they explained that they use natural language processing to uh, identify when the tension level in a company, negative tension level, is rising. And they do that because negative tension is very highly correlated to bad behavior, however you want to define bad, fraudulent or unethical or just too risky. And um, they said they wanted to talk to me because as part of their beta testing of the software, they ran the software retrospectively, retroactively, if you will, against the database of Enron emails of the top 150 people at Enron. So after Enron went bankrupt, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission took the emails of the top 150 executives, put them in a database and made it public. And so you could see exactly what was going on inside Enron if you look at that. And um, what was really interesting was this metric that they have, this measurement of tension level was moving along pretty steadily. And then all of a sudden in the middle of 1999, it plummeted, which meant when the line goes down, that means the negative tension level is rising. That's a bad thing when the line goes down. So you may remember that I told you that story about the board approving LJM. Yeah. So this happened on June 28th, 1999. Okay. And the interesting thing is if you look on that slide, it's at a high point, which means the tension is low. People are very engaged in the company and very positive. And then all of a sudden it plummets. In fact, it drops to a level where it's almost as low a week later. It's almost as low as it was on the day of bankruptcy. Okay. So this wasn't like a, a subtle movement. This is like a black swan event in the company. This is way more than two standard deviations. It so happens that that, that line dropping, that tension, negative tension spiking, corresponds exactly to the approval of that LJM deal. And they didn't know that at the time. They brought you the data set. No one, no, no one used this software didn't exist at the time. So here's the interesting thing about that. So um, people always ask me, you know, what, what could have prevented the board from doing the LJM deal? If they had seen this data, I think they would have said timeout. Look, these directors wanted to do the right thing. As you mentioned, one of the directors, I think, lost half a billion dollars when Enron went bankrupt. He was one of our largest shareholders. Um, he didn't want anything to go wrong at the company. If they had seen this drop, what it meant is that this, that this group of 150 senior executives, they became extremely negative all of a sudden. It turns out it was all in relation to that LJM deal. But here's the interesting thing. As far as I know, not one of those executives raised their hands and objected to the deal. Everyone was acting like it was the best thing we could be doing. CEOs, directors, CFOs think that they're very approachable, that people are going to tell them what they're really thinking. They want people to, but they're not going to tell them. Are you going to walk into the CEO's office and say, I think you're an idiot. I think you're unethical. I think this is the worst decision you could possibly make. That doesn't happen very often. What this software does is it tells you what people are really thinking. 
And that would have been enough just to call a timeout. And the board would have brought in management and asked them, what's upsetting you? And I think what would have happened is these people would have then said, this, this deal's a big mistake. Um, as I mentioned, that was the deal that triggered the bankruptcy. Um, I think it would have been prevented if this Keen Corp software had been around and had been used back then. On Keen Corp, um, you know, is there anything? Well, first of all, how long has the company been around? Uh, it's been around about seven years. Uh, it's really just been marketing for the last few years. It had a lot of, uh, you know, it took a long time to develop the software. And um, now it has, uh, I don't know how many customers, you know, a dozen companies, including a major financial institution, you know, kind of all across the world. And uh, a lot of interest right now. And and you think, now, if I, if I recall correctly, you had said that the board... In the board meeting, the CEO or the chairman, I can't, I can't remember if it was Lay that you said it was, who did, but said that the risk, I mean, there, it was known and given to the board that the, it was the, the front page headline risk was there. But essentially what you're saying is that this data captures, and I think we'll look at another slide here a little bit where you can bifurcate who exactly you're looking at or different groups. But as the right. top 150 executives, the board could have taken the top executives out of way, pulled in other executives from the company and said, clearly, there is a problem here. Like, this is your free space to speak here. That's right. But they had no reason to because there's no signal. This is like, you know what this is like, this software? It's like a check engine light on your car dashboard. Yeah. The light pops on and it says, you know what? The software is not telling you what the problem is. It's just telling you that you have a problem and where to check, where to look, what group to look in, you know, to see what's causing the problem. In other words, bring your car to a qualified mechanic. Um, and if companies were to have check engine lights for these non-financial risks, these risks they're not assessing or seeing, um, they'd be much better off. And so what's, I think you have another uh, example in here of another, so we'll look at some retroactive and then maybe we can talk about kind of what's going on with the company and, and instances yeah. that are more alive. But there's another slide of MTech, I believe, which is. Yeah, MTech was a uh, very large Dutch company that went bankrupt. It's affectionately refer referred to in Holland as the Dutch Enron. So if you're a big bankruptcy, you get the Enron uh, uh, branding on you. Um, and um, it's really interesting because um, the bankruptcy examiner used this software to look retrospectively uh, inside the company. And he saw that, um, and you could see if you have that chart up, I mm -hmm. can't see any chart, that all of a sudden there was a big drop in the Keen Corp index. So again, what that means is the, ten the negative tension in the company is rising. Okay, and again, negative tension corresponds to questionable behavior. Um, and um, But that didn't say a whole lot, right? So you see that um, it's just saying that overall negative tension's rising, but where do you look? So then the software goes in and it breaks it down by group within the company. And you could create any types of groupings you want. If you want to find out if there's a gender issue in your company, create male versus female groups. If you want to find out if you have an ethnicity issue, create it by ethnic groups. If you want to seniority issue, you, you cut it, the data all the different ways you want to cut it. In this case, they cut it by operating group. And what it showed that was that that drop off in the metric was being caused by two groups, primarily, the finance group and the legal group. It turns out that that drop off in the finance and legal group corresponded exactly to those groups engaging in structured finance transactions like we did at Enron. Yeah, and, and, the, and the, treasury, the treasury line was going the opposite. Treasury department typically doesn't deal, do the structured finance deals, yeah. but the people who are working on the deals, they were, they were feeling the tension, the negative tension of working on what they knew were misleading deals. You know what this, this software is like? It's like um, reading body language or voice inflection. So I don't know, Quentin, are you married? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So do you know when your wife is tense, even if she tells you everything's okay? <laughs> you bet. Yeah. Okay. And, and does she know if you're tense, even if you say everything's fine, nothing's bothering me? Yeah. She may not yeah. care, but yeah, she does. <laughs> why, why is that? Why is that? It's because our brains are so familiar with our, our spouses or significant others, body language and voice inflection patterns that even the slightest deviation gets picked up and it sends a signal to us that says something's wrong. That's how this software works, except for written communication. And so what happens is when people write memos, when they write emails or text messages, what they don't realize is that their language construction changes based upon their tension level, just like voice inflection and body language change. And this software picks up that change in pattern and is able to understand context, et cetera, and identify whether that's a positive or negative increase in tension. And again, negative tension corresponds to bad behavior going on. So there are all different types of risks that this software, uh, it's being run in many companies right now. Um, and um, uh, it's uh, picked up management alignment risks, safety risk. Um, you know, uh, if, a, if you have a safety team on a project, their only job is to raise their hand, you know, stop, stop the project when the safety risk is getting out of hand. They're very late to raise their hand. Why? Because we don't want to raise our hand. We know it's going to shut down the project. Um, and the software picks up the rising tension level in the safety group before they even raise their hands. Um, it picks up retention risk, uh, engagement risk. Uh, it's been used for a lot of change adoption programs. So you can see if your employees are responding positively or negative to changes that you're implementing. Um, obviously, financial reporting, you saw the Enron and Imtech examples. Um, and um, one risk that one client described uh, the risk he was looking for is social media risk. And he said, look, you know, all it takes is one social media disaster, us doing one stupid thing. And it could destroy the company now because social media is so so all encompassing. So he said, our employees are going to know if we're doing something stupid. So I want to see any time this line starts dipping down um, and then pinpoint why it's dipping down. So that's what it's used for. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty nifty tool. The, one of them uh, that you mentioned just at the beginning of all the different risks, I forget exactly how you stated it, but the, what popped in my head um, was Boeing and I don't know. You know, you have to have, I mean, you have to have a continuum kind of of the email. I mean, you, you have to have a full data set, so to speak, right? But if you, my guess, and maybe we'll get lucky someday and, and we'll get to see this, but my guess is if you were to go back over the last decade and look at Boeing, um, much of the um, kind of engineering risk and kind of what, what seems like the degradation of um, safety protocols and their engineering uh, would have been picked up. In well, I think, I think, you know, if, if this software were to work the same at Boeing as it's worked, or if, if you would assume the Boeing population, they're human beings, like the other populations are human beings, the same thing would have been happening when they're making these very uh, challenged decisions about things like safety, tension levels rising when the pressure on the group to approve something it, that may not be quite right is rising, uh, the tension level would rise. And you'd see that spiking in the data or in the data would be going down, right? Yeah. Meaning the negative tension is spiking. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you could go back and you'd probably be able to match those things up uh, pretty well. Uh, Boeing's a great, you know, Boeing's a great example, you know, for this gray area, you know, rules versus principles discussion, because, you know, Boeing, um, obviously they've had this disaster at Boeing. I mean, a disaster on a couple of different ways, obviously loss of life with the two 730, 737 MAX planes going down. That's a disaster, uh, of great magnitude. Um, but for the shareholders of Boeing, it's been a disaster as well, right? The stock has dropped what 80, 85%, um, since those crashes, um, bouncing up a little bit now, but it's, uh, it's still most of the value of the company is gone. Um, and here's the interesting thing. 
Um, do you think those engineers who signed off on the 737 MAX were thinking, you know, it's okay if 500 people die as long as I get my year-end bonus? No, I don't. No, of course not. I mean, of course not. Um, what they were, so what were they thinking? They're thinking, I have to meet the safety guidelines. Now, Congress has subsequently done an investigation into Boeing, and they published the results about a, three weeks, four weeks ago. And it was really interesting because I think it was uh, DeFazio, Representative DeFazio, or his chairman of the committee, he said something, and I'm paraphrasing, the problem is they followed all the rules and people died. Now, here is an issue for Boeing, right? So think of, think of the gray area in this way, Quentin. On the one extreme, we now have the technology to build a plane that will never crash, right? It could be built a certain way. We have that technology. The problem is if you build that plane, it's too expensive and no one will buy it. So it won't get built. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the government minimum safety standards that you have to meet. Apparently, according to the congressional report, Boeing met the minimum safety standards, but they've lost 85% of their share, shareholders' wealth, and probably some of those executives will be prosecuted. And, um, you know, Boeing may or may not survive. Okay. Now, the question is, should Boeing have gone farther? I would bet this software, KeenCorp software, would have picked up the tension level in that group that's approving the 737 MAX and either the regulators or uh, the board or the management would have been alerted. Um, and maybe they would have rethought their decision, but it's just like the check engine light going on. You might drive your car for a little while once the engine light's on, but you're probably not gonna let your wife and children drive it. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, is Obviously, the the I, I'm going to guess one of the obvious hurdles in getting the software as from a sales perspective into a company is you know I don't want to I don't want to know it's wrong right yeah um, but and and I'd actually like to hear um, about that challenge and where you guys have been successful but I you know perhaps because we had discussed about it, one of the one of the groups that's interested in it is auditors. And I think it's fascinating, and I can make an analogy to the Boeing, is that uh, the auditor auditors can use it on their specific audit groups. So right. the audit group at Enron is the tension is going up, the index is going down, and you can go there and say, look, tell me, not the company, tell me, the auditor, your boss, what the problem is, because clearly we need to do it. And that saves the auditor's butt. But the auditor being the gatekeeper, instead of being able to prosecute the auditors and the problems that comes with that, it allows the auditor to kind of stop the step in at a higher level. And the analogy that I would see there to Boeing is the FAA. If the FAA had it and said, We've got all these guys, and what are they mad? Or you know, what are they? What are they tense about? Well, they're tense because all the people from Boeing are self-regulating themselves now. You have that same kind of interaction, right? right uh, that you have with the auditors. So um, that, that wasn't really a question, but I, I think that that's probably accurate. But maybe you could get into some of the challenges that the company has seen with getting in the hurdle of getting it sold. And then different ways that we make, you know, different uses. And then how do you get over the hurdle of, of getting it into the boardroom? Yeah, well, the the um, uh, the uses are pretty straightforward because everywhere it's been used, it's identified things that management or directors haven't known about uh, that they think are very valuable to know. Um, so it's been, you know, uh, uh, very well received by um, the company's customers so far. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, is... Uh, you know, what I now I'm not I don't work for the company. Right. So I invest in the company. So I'm not out there selling it. But, you know, I, I call it the Sergeant Schultz uh, syndrome, which is, you know, I see nothing. I hear nothing. You know, uh, it's not clear that everyone wants to know what their biggest risks are or what their emerging risks are. Um, uh, but, you know, I guess, you know, at some point, um, 
you've got to ask yourself, um, would I rather know now when I could still manage the situation or would I rather find out later when I have no control over the situation? You know, once it gets into the hands of a short seller or a plaintiff's attorney or a social media mob or a government enforcement agency, you know, they're not going to quit if they've got, you know, if they've got the hook in something, they're not going to let go. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, one thing, you know, I had had this pie in the sky idea of uh, having a table in the 10K. Now everything's hyperlink indexed or whatever it is on SEC Edgar, where, you know, anybody who works at the company above some level, low management, uh, senior management or something, who has ever been involved in any sort of SEC prosecution ended up on the you know, the the press release that the SEC puts out that absolutely nobody looks at except, you know, the short sellers on Twitter who, you know, go, oh, you know, we've got no, no one ever going to see this and these guys, you know. If those, if there was a table where I say, look, you know, uh, Andy Fastow, he's uh, so-and-so position here. You click here and you can read all the information and it's just creating more disclosure. I can see with this keen index where, you know, it's like ESG. We want people to know that we're taking this seriously. And it's it wouldn't be foolproof because it doesn't mean that they're actually paying attention to it, right, at the, at the board level. But I'd say, look, here's our Keen Index. And this has been ap- academically proven to be able to show where there are problems. And you could give an overall Keen Index and then you could have ethnic and, and gender and, and finance and all things. And you could have it. And it's kind of a badge of honor to put it. And you could put it as one of those red flags of like, if a company's not putting it there, why aren't they? You know, why don't you have it? Um, so I, I see a lot of, uh, I think it's a very, uh, very unique um, way to go about it. Now, Quentin, Quentin and I describe it as this. It's this simple. It helps executives. It helps directors. It helps anyone in business to become a little more self-aware. That's really the problem. Again, I can't emphasize enough. I, I mean, we compliance is a problem, right? But we have a lot of really smart people, a lot of very good technology that finds the rule breakers. That's not where the problems are being created in general. The problems are being created in that gray area. And to solve that problem, um, having people check the rules isn't going to solve it. At Enron, they checked all the rules. At GE, they checked all the rules. At Boeing, apparently they checked all the rules and they approved it. It wasn't a compliance problem. So it's a matter of making people more self-aware that when they're in this gray area, there's significant risk that they're underpricing and undermanaging. And this software helps people become more self-aware. So, you know, without giving too much private detail about number of customers and all that, is there a potential that this could ultimately, you know, or, or how close are we, let's say, to where uh, this could be academically proven? Because the other thing that I see to solve the gray area problem of prosecution, because I, I am still a believer that we have a problem with prosecuting white collar crime in this country. And one of the reasons is, is why it was so hard to prosecute uh, Enron and, and uh, the executives there is because following the rules and they would say like the task wasn't said like we really can't find what happened and what it came down to was lying right it wasn't they didn't want to get into all the the nitty-gritty of the deals because they wouldn't have won on that right but if you had a keen index right and it was um academically rigorous in the sense that whatever had been put through some study that had been done and you could go and you could present it to a judge or present it to a jury and say, look, it doesn't matter if they followed the rule. This index shows without a doubt that people inside the company knew that what they were doing was whatever you want to say it wrong, pushing the envelope. Like if, if you can prove uncomfortable tension, then you can prove that there is a sense of we've crossed that gray area. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, You know, and I like to think of the software much more as a tool that 
people can use to become better managers and avoid the problem to begin with. You know, you're thinking of it as a short seller. You know, how do I use it to attack? You know, I'd rather companies say, hey, let's get rid of these problems, you know, before they become, you know, ammunition for the short seller or government enforcement agency. The problem isn't, you know, the problem is that just not seeing them right now. And this this is artificial intelligence software that, uh, you know, it's called natural language understanding software that enables pe- managers to see things they're not otherwise seeing. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't build a product and not be able to see the assembly line or the manufacturing facility. Um, this is very analogous. You, it's just more information to help you do your job better and avoid those types of uh, problems. How, how do people get in touch with, with you, either whether it's for is consulting, all, you know, all the things that you do, and then I guess uh, Keen Corp as well? Yeah, um, I think probably email is the best way. Although uh, uh, for Keen Corp, the best uh, the best email address would be North America at KeenCorp.com. That's K E E N C O R P dot com. North America at KeenCorp.com. And for me, if anyone wanted to, would want to contact me, it would be uh, the email is former Enron CFO at gmail.com. Easy to remember. That's, that's no, no one, surprising, no one else wanted that email. <laughs> no, no. I, you may need to get a domain name. Just <laughs> enroncfo.com, I think that would be where we go. Uh, well, look, I, truly fascinating. You're, you're a fascinating guy. Uh, I, you know, glad that uh, we were able to uh, hunt you down and that you agreed to speak with us. Um, I think that um, a- out of all the problems that I've seen, I think that, that, that we've kind of addressed, I think that your problem is, is kind of the most spot on. And I- I've somewhat lived through it myself and some of my own things is that um, this idea of, of legal fraud and you can follow the rules and, and still have wrongdoing. And it's actually one of the hardest um, hardest problems to tackle. And, and the fact that, you know, there's this, very unique tool out there. Um, I, I, I wish it the best. It's, it sounds fantastic and uh, wish the company and, and you as well. Uh, thanks. So thanks for being here. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you, Quentin. Bye. Right. Bye. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.